Okay, so we are recording. Okay, well, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you, working group, for um, being here again on a Wednesday, sorry, Friday, <laughs> Friday afternoon, um, standing between <laughs> uh, you and the weekend. So um, uh, just to open up, uh, this is the um, September 23rd, um, 2022 meeting of the Solar Bylaw Working Group for the Town of Amherst, and uh, we can get uh, get started. Um, again, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, Chris, good to see you here as well. And Stephanie, thanks for um, uh, getting us all organized. Okay, so um, I'm getting myself organized with the agenda in front of me, uh, and particularly the version of the agenda that I have with my talking notes. Um, okay, so, um, well, first order of business is um, to recognize that um, based on my notes, it's um, Jack's turn to uh, take the minutes for today's meeting. Um, does that work for you, Jack? Thumbs up. Good. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, and uh, thank you, uh, Janet, right, who took the uh, meetings from the last um, meeting, if I recall. Yeah, uh, that's my, my notes. I have Janet. Um, that being said, uh, those minutes are not available yet uh, for us to review, um, but Janet's going to be working on that, from what I understand, uh, in coordination with Stephanie. Uh, and so the Good news is we do not have um, minutes to approve uh, today from last meeting, which means um, that we will likely do double duty on approving the minutes from last meeting as well as today's meeting um, at the next meeting. Okay. Um, gotcha. And why don't I take let me just see here. Okay, we'll we'll um, at the end of the at the end of the agenda today we'll schedule the next meeting. I don't think we have a regular time yet, and maybe uh, time permitting, we can um, work to to settle on a um, recurring time that we can all just get in our calendars going forward. Dwayne, uh, I'm sorry, Jack has his hand up. I, I see that. So yep, okay. I'm getting to that uh, right sorry. now, uh, and I just wanted to preface that by saying. Um, uh, well, this working group is um, collaborative and, and uh, cooperative and all friendly uh, in my mind. Uh, let let us do practice good um, uh, conduct in in the meetings uh, in terms of uh, raising your hand and and uh, call and having me call on you and hopefully in somewhat in sequential order that I see your hands go up. Um, and, um, and, 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 and wait for, uh, wait for your turn. Um, so with that, Jack, you have your hand up. I, I do. And, and it's with regard to, uh, the minutes, you know, we're all kind of, I mean, I've taken minutes many times for different meetings, but, um, I'm just wondering about the process. So, uh, is Stephanie going at, you know, so we'll get a draft and then Stephanie, you'll kind of massage it or, uh, how, how does this process go? But because I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my minutes like within the hour after our meeting, because uh, I'm just gonna be typing during this and give it my best. I'm not gonna watch you know rewatch the video or anything like that. I'm just gonna give it my best shot. Um, is that is that reasonable? That's fine. So what I typically do is when I receive the minutes, because everybody does do them a bit differently, I will watch the recording. And if there are gaps, I'll fill in the gaps. Um, I don't do a lot of, I, I don't change the content or anything, you know, unless it's something that um, is completely irrelevant or an opinion that doesn't fit into the context of the discussion um, that might get removed um but otherwise it's mainly just filling in the gaps of information so and i do listen to the recordings um to do that so okay. that's fine if you want to do yeah. that that's whatever works I mean, for I'm, you and i'll i'll format them to make sure they're consistent with the other ones as well okay i'm just kind of taking the agenda and just fill in under each item 
you know, what I perceive and uh, hand it over to you, Stephanie. So, all right. Sure. Just want totally to make fine. that clear. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, with that, let's move on then to the next agenda item, which is uh, staff updates. Um, and um, Stephanie, hopefully you had a nice vacation <laughs> and maybe not have too many updates then, uh, but, uh, but uh, we welcome any updates that you can bring us. Um, sure. So uh, as you noted, I, I was um, away for a week, so I, I don't have a lot of updates. Um, I will say in terms of the, um, I know that Dwayne will get into it and maybe I'll just cover it quickly now, Dwayne, if that's okay. But the for the solar assessment, um, Dwayne and I did review the one proposal that we had. There was nothing that would lead us to reject the proposal because there are certainly requirements of what we can and can't reject and why. Um, and so they they met all of the criteria for the in the proposal that we had asked for. So um, we will be moving forward, but that's the only update. There's no been no uh, contract issued with this particular consultant. I can't name them until the contract is signed and executed. Um, but then when it is, we'll certainly um, share the proposal and share the name of the consulting firm for that assessment. Um, and then the only other update I wanted to in, let you know about is that I um, am actually now the director of sustainability. So I've had a title change. Congratulations. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. Um, so um, it doesn't really change a whole lot in terms of my work with this committee or uh, the work that I do. It, it kind of recognizes the work that I've been doing mainly. So um, so thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and uh, it's to your credit of many years of, of service to the town. Uh, and to sustainability uh, that uh, uh, and, and your um, uh, promotion of sustainability to the highest levels of town government, um, it, it's real recognition and, and uh, um, reflection on your work uh, that that position has been created um, and that you've stepped into that position. So congratulations. And that's great for um, um, our work uh, and the work of this uh, working group as well to have you, um, you know, reporting directly as a director. Um, so congratulations on that. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, questions or comments for Stephanie before we move on to Christine? Super. Okay. Um, Chris, any updates? Oh, I just wanted to mention a few things. One is that I'm still working with Nate Malloy and our building commissioner, um, Rob Mora, to refine the scope of work for a consultant to help us with technical aspects of the zoning of the zoning portion of this work, the solar bylaw. Um, and I'm hoping to meet with Janet McGowan um, sometime soon to talk to her. She's been thinking about the framework or the structure of the um, <clears throat> solar bylaw. And I wanted to hear her thoughts on that. And then, um, you know, be launching into the writing of the solar by bylaw, at least a draft of it fairly soon. We had talked initially about waiting until the site assessment was well on its way, but I don't think that is that makes sense because they're going to be you know running on parallel tracks and we're supposed to be finished with our work by May. So we're, we'll be launching into that and we've been researching what other town bylaws say. And um, so I think that's really all I have to say. That's all I have to update. Great. That's excellent, Chris. Thank you. And, and that um, uh, actually we'll probably talk a little bit more about that if if uh, if um, we can in uh, item five uh, on the agenda, uh, which was basically really um, for us to sort of discuss and fully um, have a path forward with regard to um, how we plan to outline um, outline and start uh, drafting the the um, uh, the bylaw, not not to jump right into it, but at this point discuss uh, sort of the process to get there uh, and um, and amongst amongst that was was clearly um you know how this how this uh, this working group works with your planning department um to uh, to work together to move that forward so um we'll have if okay we'll hold some of that discussion for later it it sounds like maybe some of that can um then be reflected on your conversation with um Janet later mm -hmm. 
All right, great. Um, Laura? I can hold my question until we get to that part of the agenda. Okay, to the, to the part I was just discussing? Yep. Yep, okay, great. Um, super, okay. Any um, further staff updates or, uh, or comments on those staff updates before we move forward? Nope. Great, okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, let's move on to um, the, the, our work plan as a, as a um, working group. Item three, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, first, and we um, perhaps exhaustively or not discuss this at the last meeting. Um, and um, what I have done is uh, provided a, 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 a somewhat edited version, slightly edited version to reflect um, our decisions made on, on the text. Um, last meeting and as well uh, to reflect, uh, adjust some of the text to reflect the discussion that we had um, in our discussion last at the last meeting um, as well. I just want to emphasize this is not a uh, formal or specific scope of work. This is a, an outline and a, and a guide for us. Um, I have no doubt that the details of our work will depart from these um, rather broad categories and, and uh, uh, the way the text is described as we get into nitty gritty, uh, as we start working uh, and, uh, and, and uh, have the inputs coming to us and uh, from the uh, solar assessment consultants and from the um, uh, a, a, a technical consultant. Um, and so this is not the last time we will, you know, talk about specific scope of work and, and, and action. So this is really meant as a broad guide um, for us, um, as well as um, a, of the categories of work we need to do, as well as the, the schedule of that work. So this does not need to be wordsmith in my mind. Uh, but um, that being said, I'd like to uh, basically um, see if we can agree on this plan. Um, if helpful, I can bring it up on the screen, uh, though it was in your packet. Uh, I'll be happy to bring it up on the screen. Um, of course, now I need to find my notes, yep. Um, uh, so basically, I'd like to um, agree to this plan and move forward, um, unless there is uh, anything here that um, any of us cannot are not comfortable proceeding on at this point, uh, proceeding with at this point. Um, great. So you see that. Uh, let me just uh, get feedback. You see see this on the screen. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Janet. So. Um, so I think at the last meeting we had, um, we covered some of the issues that I felt were missing from the um, work plan. And it, this one looks much stronger to me. I think what's really missing, and we didn't really talk about, we just started talking about at the last meeting is the map showing sites considered suitable for installation of large scale ground mounted solar arrays with a supporting narrative report. And um, I think it's the, you know, the, basically we were looking at the charge and the solar bylaw working group is charged with prioritizing the locations for possible solar development, including large scale ground mount, rooftop, and parking lot canopy. So that, that all this language is directly from the charge. And it makes sense to me because um, you know, you could see, you know, first we do the solar, you know, we're familiarizing ourselves with the issues. There'll be the technical solar assessment. Um, there'll be outreach to the public to figure out their valley values and what's important. And then um, sort of the hard work or the interesting work comes, it's like, so gathering what we get from the technical report in terms of sites, you know, where can solar go? How much solar here? You know, there'll be legal constraints and technical constraints and shading constraints. What is the community value in terms of you know, what it wants to protect, what it wants to, um, where it wants solar, you know, all these different things. And then the question is taking, creating basically a map 
of, you know, what had, you know, where are the suitable sites, where are the priority sites um, for solar? And then as you're doing that, also doing the bylaw. And so I have been looking at a whole bunch of different bylaws from different communities, and they're making all these different choices. And so I don't think as a committee, we can make those choices about what language we want in the bylaw um, until we know where we think it should be and it should, should, shouldn't be and how it should be. And so it's just a very, you know, sort of a good process that the um, town council has set out for us. But I really do think what's missing is the, the um, map showing sites in Amherst suitable for the installation of solar and what the priority is. And so that just is, it's in our work, you know, it's in our charge. It's just not in our work plan. And we talked about that a little yeah. bit at the last meeting. All right, thank you. I mean, that, that language is specifically uh, provided in the, uh, what would be the final box here um, um, of the, the um, of, of our mm -hmm. key, key activities. So let me, let me uh, go to oh, Laura. Sorry, I missed that map and narrative. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I, I must be looking at the, an old version. Yeah, I just want to say really quickly, Dwayne, um, I think one thing, you know, just I want to comment on, I think it's my understanding is this group is going to identify priority sites, um, which is in my mind very different than suitable sites. Um, and I think it's a it's an important distinction because, and and I'm gonna I was gonna suggest this before this meeting, but I think at some point it would be helpful for me to take five to ten minutes at one of these meetings and educate the group on. Um, sort of the economics behind, you know, a solar facility and some of the driving pieces uh, behind it that are not anything that we can capture here as a working group because we're not, you know, tax equity, project finance, whatever. Um, so I think that would actually be very, very valuable because, um, you know, there are limitations to what we can do. And sometimes the way we speak, it, it makes it, or I get the sense that, um, and us prioritizing a site means that solar can go there when in reality, it might not be the case at all, so. Can, can I ask a clarifying question? Um, oh, let's go with Martha first. No, why don't, why don't you let Janet go first? Okay, go ahead. So I, I'm sorry, when I read this, I don't see where we're deciding where we think the priority sites are. And so is that in, reviewing the consultant solar assessment, mapping and evaluation, review hosting scenarios and consultants, like where's the step where we take that information and say, hey, we think these are the priority sites. Cause it seems like, I don't know, it seems like that would happen, I guess, April, May, but I don't really quite see someone anywhere it says priority map showing what we think is suitable. Maybe it's just a, a nomenclature issue, but I just didn't see that language there or that process for us. So maybe I'm just- it, well, That would be in the in the last last step. I mean, in my mind, it, it, it really needs to be done in, 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 uh, um, in cooperation and in, in, in tandem with the solar assessment work. They're the ones that are gonna be mapping uh, all these potential sites out. Uh, and and their 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 attributes uh, and leading the effort on the actual community engagement on on um, uh, establishing community priorities preferences and so forth in some um, rigorous manner um, and uh, and um, part of their work will be to um, provide. Uh, this mapping and and uh, and potentially some narrative that we can use um, to um, uh, provide this um, assessment and suitable sites uh, and sites that uh, in in uh, in some regard reflect the priorities and preferences of the of the community. Uh, so that's going to be what we as a working group draw from to um, either adopt and submit in my mind to the uh, to the council and to um, the the, uh, the town with regard to our uh, uh, um, uh, our deliverables 
um, or that we um, provide some uh, explanation and, and deviation from what the, the solar assessment says. Uh, Martha? <laughs> yes, well, I would agree with both Janet and Laura. Uh, I think I think there's good points, and so it sounds like there would be a fair amount of discussion about what we're going to say on solar siting. So I would like to suggest that it be made a separate bullet there down around number 14, uh, and the time frame be moved up from May to to at least April, so that we actually would schedule uh, a block of time to, to have this discussion before we are right in the throes of writing the final report. Yep, uh, I, I can see that. I do, you know, I think in um, uh, some of this is gonna be going on in terms of discussion in what what is the Excel row, row 13 as well, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, leading up to sort of that final deliverable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, can I also ask that people put their hands down after they uh, speak so I, I can keep track of who's uh, who's in the queue? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, all right, so let me um, ask, um, I would like to, you know, recognizing that this is not, um, uh, that this can, can that we can uh, divert from from this work plan as as need be and as as conditions change uh, and um, and uh, available information comes to us in various different forms from the consultants. Uh, but at this point, uh, just as a guide for ourselves moving forward, um, are people um, comfortable holding a vote, either holding, approving this uh, without a vote uh, and moving forward or uh, moving to a vote to accept this um, work plan? Janet. So I have a quick question. Um, I'm happy to vote to support the work plan. Um, is a question for Stephanie. Are we like a month behind because we think the assessment, like what is the time frame? do you think the solar assessment will start and finish? Because that will, so much is tied up into that in the community process in terms of us, or, you know, so many of these blocks of work. Yeah, I don't think we're, we're not a month behind. I would say probably, you know, I mean, some of this is outside of my hands. <laughs> you know, it's got to do with um, the folks who are dealing with the procurement process and the contract process. Um, but I think we can probably have them, you know, ask them to kind of move it along quicker and expedite that contract execution. So I would say probably within like a couple of weeks, maybe I'm being, you know, I'm even maybe even being a little generous there. So I'm hoping that because there's only the one firm and we've already reviewed it exhaustively, <laughs> um, that we should be able to get a contract with them. We do had, a, we had a few um, follow-up items that were omitted from their contract that, but we can't actually even discuss that until they're under contract to add anything more. So we kind of have to wait till that happens. But um, those things aren't anything that should delay what what they're doing or them moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm. Um... Not that people would notice, but if you look very carefully between this version and the previous version, I did adjust some of the boxes um, to reflect the fact that we're um, it's now you know end of, of September. Uh, it, it didn't really impact things further out in the timeline, uh, but there are some slight differences there that I didn't even think was necessary to really um, explicitly discuss, but I did try to just update that a little bit given the, the um, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say delay, but just the reality of where we're at at this point. Okay. Um, I don't think we need a vote on this work plan, um, uh, but but maybe we should, should do so. Let, let's do so. Um, if I have a motion uh, to 
uh, accept this work plan, then we can have a vote on it. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the work plan. Great, thank you, Laura. Is there a second to Laura's motion? I'll second it, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Okay, you need a voice, voice vote. Yeah, okay. And uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, th thanks, you. good that you can join us. Okay, so in no particular order, Breger? Yes. Pagliarulo? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Hanner? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Uh, did I get everybody? <laughs> Anybody uh, not get to vote? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to do this with scrolling and everyone keeps moving <laughs> on my panelist list. So <laughs> they keep jumping around. So um, I think we got everybody. All right, thank you. All right, thank you everybody. And uh, we'll uh, have that to uh, refer to um, over time and uh, reflect on how we're doing uh, in terms of time schedule uh and uh and and as needed uh we can make adjustments um if if uh scopes and situations change so great uh thanks for that um put that away okay um so i'd like to move on to the next agenda item uh which is um you know this great opportunity for us as the working group and 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 appreciative of the uh of the of the town uh stephanie and and uh, uh chris uh, specifically to um enable us to make use uh with town um support uh use of the town council counselor legal counsel um to address some of the questions that we have as we set forward on, on the bylaw. Uh, and so we brought this up for discussion uh, maybe two meetings ago and uh, briefly last time, uh, but I don't think we had time to dig into it. What I'd like to do today is to um, really um, finalize uh, the set of questions we wanna put in front of the uh, legal counsel uh, who will then provide us with their um, legal opinions uh, on these matters, which are going to be really helpful to us as we um, embark on the um, bylaw uh, drafting. Um, just to update folks, um, Chris and Stephanie and myself put together sort of the first set of, uh, of um, questions to move forward. Uh, and then it's been open for um, members here to add additional questions. Uh, we did receive a few uh, additional questions. Um, and um, uh, But at this point, we'd like to uh, finalize this and uh, return it to the town. Uh, we do know that the legal counsel is, is waiting uh, to have this list finalized so they can uh, understand their uh, scope and, uh, and, and get to it. Uh, so with that, um, and let me, before I show my screen, <laughs> I want to, uh, I did in the course of uh, when since Stephanie sent it out, I did uh, the, the couple questions that I had in my mind that didn't come to me uh, before uh, did actually pop forward in my head. So I added some additional questions. Um, I don't know if that's uh, too, too late or not, uh, but I just assume include those or at least have have those for uh, folks to look at as well. Um, and um, let me uh, bring up this document then. And um, sorry. All right, and appreciate um, a few of you who did. Uh, provide some additional questions. I think the original questions are, are all here in the uh, in, in the black text. Uh, and then there were uh, a couple questions that were added um, 
I know one by me and one by uh, uh, somebody else. Um, and then, uh, and then, um, if possible, I, I I brought these these two additional questions, eleven and twelve, forward. Um, and um, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'd like to open open the floor for any comments, thoughts, discussions um, on the this set of questions. Uh, do keep in mind there's also some specific questions um, that Stephanie and, and Chris had brought forward as well with regard to battery storage um, down here at, uh, down here as well. Uh, so any um, thoughts or questions <clears throat> um, or comments on on these uh, the set of questions? Um, Chris, thank you. I think it would be helpful to read the um, questions one by one. I, it would be helpful okay. to me to focus on them because just seeing a list of questions <laughs> in front of me makes it hard for me to focus on any particular item. So I wonder if you would do that. Great. Um, and are you suggesting um, including the ones that um, have you and, and, and Stephanie and, and I had brought forward? Um, yes. Which people have have had time to review, but I'm I'm definitely happy. I mean, this is important. This is really going to be um, really helpful information to us. So I'm happy happy to do that for sure. And and uh, and we can take it one by one to see if anybody has any thoughts, questions. Maybe a, I don't want to wordsmith too much given the limited time, but uh, any any thoughts on on how the question could be better targeted? Uh, before doing so, let me um, just see uh, Janet. You have your hand up as well. So when I looked at this list of the questions, a lot of times I just said, yes, 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 yes. And a couple of them, I was like, not quite sure. And so it, you know, I went back and read Tracer Lane again, and the statute itself, 41A, allows towns to regulate dimensional requirements for um, daycare, educational institutions, and religious, religious institutions. And then it has, you know, it's, it's so you can't prevent the use, but you can regulate the dimensions on it. The solar facility language is much, much more loose and gives the towns lots of flexibility about what they can control. So the questions that are asking about dimensional requirements, I thought were just, yeah, you know, we can talk about setbacks, we could talk about size, how much can be cleared. You know, those are all what we think about in, in zoning as dimensional requirements, the size of buildings the size of a structure, how far back it has to be from the side of someone's property, how much lot coverage, how much hardscape is on there. So all of those things to me can be, um, are in, you know, those are, those are yeses, you know, because you could do that for educational institutions, religious institutions. There's nothing in the, the statute or tracer lane that says, no, you can't regulate the dimensional requirements. And so, that actually made me go back when I was reading Tracer Lane. I think that it's kind of it's kind of a weird decision, but it basically affirms towns' rights to zone and or regulate solar arrays about how they look, where they go. It's just saying you just can't have these blanket prohibitions. And what's weird about the decision is it kind of you know goes down the whole normal legal analysis, and then the court doesn't apply its own analysis. And so it just says, listen, this is an outright ban, it's bad. And so, but there's lots of language in Tracer Lane that says, you know, the interest that Waltham zoning presumably advances, the preservation of each zone's unique characteristics is legitimate. You can preserve neighborhood character. That's a legitimate zoning thing. And at the end, the last paragraph, it says, um, like all municipalities, Waltham maintains the discretion to reasonably restrict the magnitude and placement of solar energy systems, but an outright ban of large scale solar energy systems in all but one or 2% of a municipality's land area restricts rather than promotes the goal of promoting solar energy. And then in the absence of a reasonable basis grounded in public health, safety or welfare, such a prohibition is impermissible under the provision. And so it's not saying that Waltham can't regulate solar arrays in the normal way. It's just saying you just can't ban it almost everywhere. And so I think 
so I, you know, I think we can send these decisions to our town attorney, but I think a lot of it is, yeah, we can regulate that because we regulate that for other things. We could regulate, you know, so it, is that making sense to people? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Is I mean, it legalistic? I don't no, know. no. And, and if you don't mind, Dwayne, can I respond? Yes. Yeah, Laura, please. Um, so that was my question, Janet. And I think um, I want some clarity. You know, there's there are actually far more rulings that consistent with this question and mass than what I forwarded over. And um, and actually, there is sort of a fine line because I think you're right. And actually, I, actually, I want to talk to an attorney who is an expert on this, but I think you're correct in that, you know, of course you can have setback requirements, buffer zones, all of those things. Um, but other things like restricting the size of a solar facility or being really didactic about where it can and can't go, those things actually could just kill a project altogether. So if you are a developer and I can tell you that maybe a hundred mega or excuse me, a hundred, you know, 500 KW site wouldn't make sense, but a two megawatt project would, um, uh, restricting the size in that situation would potentially just prohibit the project altogether. So I, I just think there's the request, like I would love to hear from the attorney based on all of the legal opinions or all the cases that are out there, um, what is in you know our sandbox and what is what is outside of it, um, because this is uh, you know, suffice it to say that I've spoken to a number of groups who've been involved, um, you know, uh, both from the town side and the developer side. Um, in, in these sort of Massachusetts rulings. Um, and I think, you know, it just would be really good to know what is uh, permitted and what's not. Yep, and I, I, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie or, or Chris, but at the end of the day, the, the legal counsels, the town legal council will be reviewing the bylaw um, for its legal acceptability. Uh, so having their opinion at this early stage on these, you know, obviously these are all legal issues that are not necessarily black and white and and uh, need to be carefully crafted and so forth. Uh, but to have their opinion uh, and and sense on 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 these these questions or whatever we decide um, would strike me as being really helpful um, coming from our our town town legal counsels. All right, Stephanie. Thanks, Dwayne. I think um, even though it may on the face of it seem glaringly apparent from some of the language, I think it's important to have as much clarity going in as possible, even if it's a, even if it seems like an obvious, I think we definitely want legal counsel to weigh in at the very beginning. So um, even if we think it's yes, having them confirm that it's yes will be helpful to the committee in moving forward um, rather than finding out for some reason through some little, you know, other, um, you know, additional language that we didn't read or know about or weren't aware of that we were in fact incorrect. Better to know now um, right up front and have legal counsel review. So I don't, you know, think having these questions, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. And so it certainly doesn't help to include them. Thanks. Okay, uh, Martha, and then and then maybe let's let's go through the list. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just had uh, a couple of points. One was that when we discussed the legal cases, it was pointed out that it, that the overriding case was really the one that went to the SJC, which I guess was the Tracer Lane one. Was that right? Uh, and the the land court decisions were were not really. As, as much you know, setting policy as the uh, SJC. And the second question is, at the end, when we get a zoning bylaw, does that have to go to the state uh, attorney general's office or somewhere to get approved? Is there some approval process outside Chris, of Amherst? Yep, I think Chris can answer that. Yeah, um, because we're now a city, known as the town of Amherst. We do not need to have our bylaws, our new um, zoning approved by the AG's office. We used to have to do that when we were a town, but now all we have to do is send the AG's office our 
latest bylaw and they keep it in their office. But, so we don't need to get it approved. But we do want to get our uh, opinion from Kobelman and Page um, mm -hmm. before we send something to town council for a vote. We want to make sure that in their minds it's watertight and it's not going to be subject to being uh, overturned um, you know, in court. So that's it. Perfect. OK, thanks. Um, OK, let me. Um, um, start going down the questions um, and we can um, uh, maybe some of these issues will be resolved as we, we talk about the specific questions. And again, um, um, we'll, we'll try to do this relatively quickly. This, uh, this is probably the largest of the, uh, well, we still have a number of agenda items to get to, but we do wanna resolve and finalize this list for sure. Okay, so um, question one, can the size of the solar array be limited for forested land and prime agricultural land? Can the amount of clearing be limited in the case of forested or prime agricultural land? Uh, that is the amount of clearing or forest land per installation, amount of forest agricultural, prime agricultural land impacted by an installation. Yeah. Um, yep, Martha. Does the uh, state's climate action plan have any um, legal influence? You know, when I was reading the 2022 plan, you know, it talks about the importance of preserving, you know, forested land, et cetera. Is that something legal or is that just uh, words kind of? Uh, Dwayne, do you want me to respond to that? Sure, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, that's a plan. It's not a regulatory, it's not a statutory document. It's not a regulatory document in terms of, um, you know, um, it doesn't set legal guidelines. Mm -hmm. It's just a basically a, a plan for moving forward. Yeah. So we can't use that as an argument for. You can certainly reference. I mean, I would say you can reference it as you know that that it's you know within the state's goals. I think you know what might be useful is the. Uh, solar siting survey that the state is currently underway that may potentially be available to you as you're drafting this bylaw at some point. I, you know, it might be a little while before that comes out, but you know, that might be more useful. Yep. Okay, Janet. So I, um, I think a related question to this is, can the town prohibit solar on certain types of land based on their characteristics like farmland watershed residential areas you know that kind of thing and so that's you know and i think sort of what martha is saying is you know could the town say we wanted to protect our you know premier agricultural soils um or our forests because that's part of sequestering carbon under the state plan like i would put that as a rationale like the reasonable the reasons for the regulation that a court would look at. And so I think that, the, you know, it's not just the size of the array. Can you just say no large scale arrays in these zones or these areas? Um, so I think it's like a corollary question. It'd be more important, I don't know. So I don't know if it's like, not just the size, but the fact is, can you limit, you know, say solar arrays can't go in these lands for whatever reason, oh, a common, you know. Yep, yeah, uh, Jack. Yeah, it's tough taking minutes and- uh, Yeah, I know. <laughs> contributing. <laughs> but uh, I just wanna say, but it seems to me like the solar technology as, is that a place where it, it is actually uh, can be um, uh, compatible with agricultural land? You know, obviously forest land is, is a change in use, uh, but agricultural land, there's, there's numerous examples of arrays that are compatible where, you know, you can, you know, grow crops and have animals and whatever, uh, you know, and have the solar rays right there too. So I'm not sure why we're beating on this 
particular topic for the, you know, with regard to the agricultural, because that seems to, you know, it'll, you know, work itself out. Um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe, <clears throat> maybe a, a, a an add on question or corollary question here is that, um, can for for uh, projects on prime agricultural land can they be can they be required to be quote unquote dual use solar agricultural projects that's, oh, that's avail true. available in the in the solar in the state solar program but um i guess there's a question whether zoning could require that any projects put on agricultural land or prime agricultural land be in the form of dual use, enabled dual use. Hmm. Um, okay. Um, Can I? Not, yeah, Laura, sorry. Thank you. Yep. No, I was going to say that, um, actually, what I was going to say was supporting what, what Jack had said is that the state actually has prioritized projects and has provided further incentives for solar developers when they um, include agriculture yeah. um, and it's so there's a financial incentive but I also want to um, speak to the point that Janet raised in that if you like restricting things um, too much is the equivalent of a prohibition so I want this this is why I really want the attorney to weigh in on those land use laws um, because I just don't want to be having spent a considerable amount of time thinking through these forest land agriculture um, when we know that when we restrict things to a certain point, um, and if it's not for the benefit of public health and safety, um, that it might not stand up. So. Okay. Um, any more thoughts on, on this first question? <laughs> um, okay, uh, second one. Uh, can the overall size of an array be, be limited? Uh, Chris? I think there are two aspects to this. One is a megawatt power of this of the array and the other one is the actual acreage so those are two parts of question two and what is the desire here i can i can um try to in real time do some track changes on these questions um so that we can finalize this so um but they may be sort of a bit rough um so you're saying uh Chris, on this one, uh, uh, by size, capacity, uh, or by acreage. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, yeah, uh, Stephanie. Sorry, just a procedural thing, uh, Dwayne. If you want to do that, you know, make notes and send them to me, I'll clean it up and then Perfect. send out a final version to everybody after, and I'll post okay. it in the resources packet. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, uh, very good. Uh, question three, can an array be prohibited from being constructed in certain, uh, from being constructed in certain cases, such as on steep slopes? Can there be a specified uh, slope threshold defined? Maximum slope on which an array can be installed? Maximum slope on an access driveway um, leading to an array? Um, I think we've seen this in, in uh, some of the, uh, if not model, uh, some of the town bylaws we've looked at. Um, I guess the, the idea here is to get some uh, opinion from our, our town council uh, to um, give us um, cover and confidence to, uh, to address this issue. Um, and sorry, Stephanie, is your hand up again or, or from the last time? Yep, okay. Apologies. Nope. Um, any thoughts on this question? Great. All right. That's progress. <laughs> uh, number four, can there be a requirement for solar develop 
for solar developer for the solar, solar developer to cover the cost of third party inspections uh, and reporting during construction. Yeah, this came up in uh, some of our discussions earlier. So, um, uh, and I think would be a helpful question to uh, to hear from. All right, great. Um, <laughs> how do you define public welfare? I'm sure the legal counsel will have fun with that one. Uh, is there a threshold size that constitutes public, uh, i.e. can an individual property owner be considered public? Um, and uh, corollaries are, um, are aesthetics considered a public welfare, visual impacts, requirements for screening, uh, amounts of noise produced by an array, array or, or battery storage as, as examples. Any thoughts here? I mean, this has come up. I'm wondering whether, um, are there any other things we want them to opine on other than aesthetics uh, with regard to uh, whether that's in the purview of public welfare, um, Jack? Yeah, I mean, I could provide, you know, with regard to the Massachusetts contingency plan, uh, which deals with the you know, cleanup of, uh, you know, way sites, uh, we have this uh, metric uh, with regard to, you know, public welfare, welfare, and I can, you know, pass on that language. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't, again, don't feel like we need to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, it, public welfare is pretty obvious in terms of, you know, the noise and smell and visual and things like that. Uh, but certainly not, does not necessarily, you know, include health and, and safety, uh, you know, or environmental impact. So, um, but I can provide that language to Stephanie if she wants to, you know, reference that, but that's real standard with regard to what I do uh, as a licensed site professional. So, yep, I think that would be um, helpful for the lawyer to have access to. If uh, I'm sure they have access to all sorts of things, but if it's if it seems applicable and relevant, maybe to a different area, but has some uh, um, relevance to the solar and battery area, um, having that. In, um, for the lawyer to be able to um, reference or or um, consult with, I guess, uh, seems like it would be helpful. Yeah, I'm wondering if like, uh, in, you know, with, you know, Stephanie's involvement with the, um, you know, you know, wetlands law is, are there existing, you know, provisions for public welfare there or, or not? But um, certainly I, I, I use this all the time. Um, uh, Dwayne, if I might, I, I would just say, Jack, just send it to me what you have and we would just send it on to legal counsel. Okay. They're, they're going to be well-versed in this, I think. <laughs> so oh, I'm sure. I, I think if you just send that information to me, I'll forward it along as part of a packet of the questions and then other supporting documentation, like the, um, court decisions that Laura would like to be provided as well as your document. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to make a mention of why we put this in here. And it, mm -hmm. there was a comment that came early in our meetings um, where we had a question about, okay, if water is um, somehow polluted or contaminated by some aspect of this, is it considered public welfare if it just applies to one household right. or does it have to be multiple households or the whole town so that's why we wanted clarity on what exactly does public mean and that's i just wanted to explain that to everybody who was here yeah that's that, that's a good refresher uh, thanks chris uh because obviously the you know solar collectors or and even battery storage now can be applied um and installed at, at uh um, at the residential level um janet um, just a quick thing. There's a Supreme Court case that gives a very broad definition of public welfare, and I could send that to Stephanie. Um, and it includes prosperity, so like economic, you know, development and things like that. Trying, you know, so you can, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's just it's been given a very broad definition, aesthetic, 
public convenience, comfort, peace, order, prosperity, things like that. So I can send that to Stephanie. And so. Sure. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, just to clarify, is that the federal or the state Supreme Court? It's the U.S. Supreme Court. So there are ultimate overlords versus the SJC or the state state law overlords. Okay. We're doing mad in that. Okay. Um, all right. Great. All right. Any other thoughts on that? Question number five. Great. Okay. Uh, no, uh, yeah, Jack. Um, I've never seen prosperity uh, <laughs> in terms of public welfare. I mean, for a development project, I mean, that's just, um, but hey, we can sort I, it out. <laughs> I have another. Um, yeah, Laura. I'm sorry. I didn't raise my hand. Sorry. Never mind. Just supporting. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, number six, can there be minimum setbacks in excess of those pertaining to buildings? Uh, that, uh, for, I, uh, that is small towns have hundreds of feet of setback, uh, of setback required uh, and distances from residences. Um, yeah. Uh, any th thoughts on this question or any um, further elaboration on this question? Yeah, I guess this is getting at, um, obviously there's setbacks in, in zoning as was talked about before, but can these be um, in excess of, of uh, those that pertain to buildings? Um, and um, uh, and to what at what point does, do they become overly restrictive? Um, uh, but on the other side, what what at what point do they become infringe on uh, public welfare? I guess. <laughs> okay, Jack. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm not muted. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, so you know, we're producing this white paper out of the uh, water supply, you know, protection committee, and you know, we've looked at all these things and the setbacks. You know, I would think for buildings, um, they're they're innocuous sort of thing, and the setbacks that we're looking at is more with regard to you know private wells, uh, standards set by septic systems, um, you know, setbacks to wetlands and things like that. So this one seems like it'll take, you know, the, the council, you know, five minutes to, to respond to, but it, I'm wondering why we're including this, but. Um, yeah. I think, yep. Okay. Um, if it is five minutes, even in lo legal uh, <laughs> realms, that's probably not too much money. So it's probably a good, uh, to have have this stated uh, by by legal counsel uh, so that we have some guidance there. Great. Uh, number seven, can there be mitigation stated for adverse environmental impacts uh, for uh, that is uh, erosion, pollution of water supply? Um, for example, language it says that in the event of this, uh, the um proponent i guess shall provide for why laura yeah my sense is that this is really at least this particular question is really um already addressed um in local and state bylaws i mean if there's if someone doesn't adhere to you know the requirements set out by the conservation committee. There's a very clear escalation process um, that happens with the state if you're in violation. If you're, for example, if you're, you know, there's erosion and it, you know, ends up running into, you know, a, a body of water or, you know, there's, so, I mean, I'm not sure what, why we're keeping it there, but we can, you know, if that's something that the group feels strongly about. I 
there's a sense link with having the embers. Yep, go ahead, Jack. I was just going to say, yeah, I, you know, uh, to support kind of Laura on this, but I think I just feel like this is a little bit superfluous um, because this is, you know, we're, we're going to be hardwiring this in to the to the bylaw. I mean, it's I, I'm not sure why this is here, but. Um, right, go ahead, Chris. I think there are instances where we're not in a jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission where this might be helpful. Um, you know, if you're up high on a on a slope and the wetland is way down below, well, you may have adverse environmental impacts um, sometime before you get to the hundred foot buffer. So, I feel like having some clarity about this topic would be useful. All right. Yeah, Janet. So uh, I read, I've seen um, bylaws which say, you know, if you're cutting down like five acres of trees, you need to protect like 10 acres of trees and that's seen as mitigation. Um, and then, so that, that was what I thought was in this question, but I also think about mitigation is I'm cutting down five acres of trees and the mitigation for that is planting five <laughs> acres of trees. Cause you know, to, you know, try to balance the carbon loss and things like that. So I, I think it's kind of a good question because um, I, you know, and then I, I didn't think about Chris's angle, but that makes sense to me also. Great, and I, I did one of the questions I added on at late notice was uh, reflecting on, on that idea, uh, Janet, we'll get to that. Um, all right, good. Um, Jack, is your hand back up, sorry. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, when we're talking about carbon impact of force versus solar, which is solar is, is a is a field, uh, grass, you know, field. Uh, I, I feel like there's there's some sort of uh, assumption that we're making that that isn't correct, that that we need to kind of clarify that when you replace force with a solar field that you're reducing or you're increasing the carbon impact, which I don't know that that's a fact. And we need to clarify that, I think, sooner than later, moving forward. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's clear evidence and, and reasonable consensus that solar is, is um, uh, just from a straight carbon perspective, uh, cutting down forests and putting up solar that displaces fossil fuel generation uh, is a net gain for carbon um, substan substantially. Um, collector efficiency is a lot more efficient than photosynthesis. Um, um, that, that, that being said, uh, there's still some reduction uh, from carbon than if you put the solar collector somewhere else that didn't have trees. Uh, so, you know, there still could be some mitigating um, uh, uh, desire to mitigate for, for what you did lose uh, from, that, from that carbon uh, from, from the forest. Um, uh, it, it, obviously, the, the carbon uh, it balance strongly depends on what you do with the trees, too, uh, that you remove in terms of whether that sequestered carbon stays in, in finished wood products or um, find some other fate. Um, and and I, I will say that I think, while it may not be definitive, I think um, the, the scope of work that DOER has set out on for this statewide solar incentive, solar assessment, um, does also include a scope to look at that specific issue because it's raised around the Commonwealth. Uh, so I think we would probably be best, even though it may be um, some time before that actually comes out. Um, my sense is that we're probably uh, good to to wait for for that analysis to come forward. Uh, Martha. Yeah. <laughs> well. Okay. Okay. You 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 kind of answered. I mean, I just want to push back a little and say that you know both are needed. I mean, we have to get to quote net zero, meaning 
we have to, there's always going to be some residual emissions and we really have to increase the amount of drawdown and the uh, climate models indicate that. So as best we can, we have to in, avoid the impact of uh, reducing or eliminating large tracts of forest by you know, doing some kind of mitigation like there is here. Yeah. All right, great. And I think th these are discussions we'll get into once yes. we start putting yes. Pen yes. pencil to paper and fingers to keyboards on, on the bylaw. So great. Um, okay. Um, but still, it seems like a, a good question to get some uh, thoughts on from the legal counsel. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on to eight here. And I guess this starts to get into some of the questions that have been added by members here. Uh, so the first one, um, given that the SJC has affirmed that towns and cities can regulate solar arrays to protect public health, safety, and welfare, do you recommend that towns explain the connection between regulation of solar arrays and public health, safety, and, and or welfare? And if so, do you recommend this explanation in the initial purpose uh, section, purposes section? Um, bylaws tend to start out with this sort of um, introduction, introduction and purpose. Uh, section, um, and I think we've seen some preambles um, along these lines in some of the other towns, um, but I guess uh, the member is asking that it would be help, suggesting it would be helpful for the legal counsel to um, uh, give opinion on um, whether this is rec a recommended practice and to put it into the uh, preamble, if you will. Um, any thoughts on that? All right, good. Um, all right, um, the second, the, the number nine now here, uh, may a town solar bylaw include requirements or encouragements uh, for solar development to demonstrate economic benefits to the community? Uh, for example, a provision requiring that project financing provides an opportunity, for example, a right of first refusal for local constituents to take an ownership stake in projects uh, that would otherwise be sold to third-party investors, or that developers are required to reasonably demonstrate that financial terms over the project lifetime maximizes the value to the local community through land lease, pilot, electric or net metering credits, off-taker off uh, discount terms, or buyout ownership uh, flip options. Um, I read that with some familiarity because I put that one in there. Um, and so um, this is, you know, I'm, I'm curious about this uh, 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 as, a, as an area that, that um, we're trying to pursue and move forward to get more community benefits uh, from the solar development to stay local. My question really is not about the, the, the wisdom of that, but whether uh, there's any precedent or uh, re, or, or um, concerns about language like that being in a zoning bylaw. <laughs> um, so, Laura? Yeah, I think the only piece that really pops out to me is um, requiring project financing provides an opportunity like a ROFR. So in that cash waterfall, you have tax equity, you have debt, you have takeout, you know, sponsor equity, and um, I have real concern with making that a requirement um, because um, I can, you know, like, you know, the US banks of the world who are providing tax equity, um, those types of transactions would actually, a requirement would actually prevent a project from getting done. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the one that just sort of, um, I love the concept, right? Um, but, I think once it's baked, I think it's hard to to go back. So, and sorry, Laura, can you which was this? There was a specific the, the part of provision that? requiring that project finance provide an opportunity, like a rofer, for local constituents to take ownership stake in the project that would otherwise be sold sold to third party investors. So you you know this, Dwayne, but you know ninety five percent of the time, a solar developer is selling the project at, when it's construction ready. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of how it goes. And then that flip option you're talking about, and this is where I feel like I need to give like a solar development 101, that flip option is just has to do with tax equity. 
whether it's a partnership flip or, or whatever that might be. Um, so um, anyways, I just think if it was encouraged, okay, required, I, I would have a lot of concern with because I think it would be prohibitive for, for an average solar project to, to require that. They wouldn't be able to get debt and tax equity, basically. Uh, yeah, well, first, I look, I, I'm not familiar with the ROFR term you mentioned. Is that a, a uh, right of first refusal? Right of first refusal. Sorry. Okay. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Gotcha. Okay. I, I know a pilot, uh, but uh, I, did, I haven't heard of that, that ROFR. Okay, good. Uh, um, all right. Um, yeah, again, we're, I'm not suggesting this as, as something we want to put in the bylaw. I'm just curious about whether it's something we could put in a bylaw. Uh, um, and, and obviously, potentially with softer language with regard to encouraging versus requiring. Um, uh, though I'm, I'm happy to sort of edit, edit a little bit to soften it up a little bit. All right, Jack. Yeah, I'm, I'm guess I'm I'm getting you know um, bogged down here with with the verbiage. <laughs> I just wonder if you can do like a uh, a layman's version of this paragraph for us, Dwayne. I mean, just really dumb it down for me. Yeah, well, um, and and Laura can help in this, I'm sure. But you know, um, and I, I I'm not suggesting that the large multi megawatt scale uh, solar projects would necessarily lend themselves to local ownership and financing because those are multi multi million dollar projects. Uh, that being said, there is a, 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 a certainly a, 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 I, I shouldn't, there's certainly a sweeter spot of, of solar development, uh, you know, probably in the hundreds to um, close to a megawatt scale, uh, where um, towns are are uh, missing out that are that are you know almost always uh sold to third party investors equity investors nationally based equity investors the idea here is that um uh to make solar more acceptable to towns uh and be more receptive to, to hosting solar um and and uh, gaining economic benefits that are retained locally in the community uh, is a lost is currently a lost opportunity uh, for in solar development in across Massachusetts and, and the nation for that matter. Uh, and um, as Laura mentioned, I mean the the momentum uh, of the state state of the state of the art of how you go about solar financing is just you know go to the U.S. national banks and get solar equity. Um, there there is reasonable community interest in in uh, challenging <laughs> that that uh, business model uh, and opening up opportunities for uh, business models that retain more local um, uh, ownership and investment in these projects uh, or uh, otherwise maximize the value of these projects to the local uh, local community uh, so this is really what I'm trying to get at here is is through this zoning bylaw process is there a way to um, require maybe too strong, uh, but to encourage uh, that um, how a, a solar developer that um, get gains permission to develop a project in 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 our town um, has to uh, at least enable the consideration of potentially a rofer for um, local uh, local ownership. Um, happy to edit this a bit to to uh, make it a little bit shorter and and uh, succinct and, and to the point. But all right, uh, Janet. Um, I think that's an interesting um, issue and idea, and it would be good to know if we can do it. Um, it's not saying we should do it. Um, so I I when I read this, I was thinking more along. Um, like, what about if we offer, the town offered um, a tax break to solar developers who build canopies over parking lots because they're more expensive? Or 
over, you know, things like that. And I, I know we do that <clears throat> regular bylaw for um, people building low income housing that the town manager can um, negotiate like a 10 year tax break. You, I think we did this in North Square where, you know, year one, they're not paying any taxes and escalating amounts by year 10 and just trying to think of ways through our own tax system to take the burden off of solar developers or a way to encourage solar development in the places we'd like to see it. So I, I, I think we can do that. I just, it just, I had that idea because I've, you know, as I was looking at different bylaws, like, and I like, I like the idea of um, clarifying, like, what can we do and not do in terms of these kind of local arrangements. Yeah. Um, I'll just comment first and then we'll go to Laura and then Jack. I mean, I, clearly the state solar program is set up so that there's differential incentives for and, and higher incentives for parking lots, certainly uh, parking canopies and so forth. Um, so I, I guess there would be a question of whether even additional incentive is necessary. Um, I think we want to be careful to not offer tax incentives that it's local tax in incentives, if that's even a feasible thing. Um, that the developers don't really need, but just pocket at the expense of more local economic benefits, because uh, those tax revenues are important, and local benefits, uh, and some of the relatively few local benefits that we get from solar development. Um, and so, um, uh, so we'd have to consider that. But just the, uh, I'm not at all suggesting that understanding what's the limits of a zoning bylaw to address that issue um, uh, that, that could be done, not necessarily that we would want to. Uh, but Laura, I was actually going to say that I really like Janet's idea a lot um, because I mean there are incentives for canopies and low income offtake through the state, but um, frequently, especially with things like canopies and landfills and rooftops, they're not adequate. So I'm not sure if that's permitted. It might be a total you know uh, no go. But you know if we're really if the if the town becomes serious about really wanting solar development on certain sites, um, that's certainly a, a massive lever we could pull. Great, uh, Jack? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, it seems to me like, you know, when we're talking about parking lots, that we just, we're talking on such minuscule acreage. Uh, but I have to say that I'm impressed, you know, going up to UMass on University Drive and seeing all the, you know, the parking lot, you know, solar canopies there and wondering maybe you know, maybe you can shed some light with regard to how they got there. Because it's just like, I, I guess I've been down University Drive in a while and I just saw that. It's like, wow, that it, it's a great thing that UMass did. Um, wonder if you can, you know, shed some light on that, Dwayne. Yeah, well, um, from, from uh, what I can tell you is that yet yeah, you, you, when you say UMass did it, yes, uh, they um, opened up their parking lots um, and prepared their parking lots to enable solar canopies, um, uh, with the exception of the one by the visitor center, um, the university does not own the projects. Uh, they're third party owned uh, and and the uh, electricity is sold. Um, I, I don't know exactly how that works, but I think either so, the electricity because it is a micro it is essentially a microgrid. So I'm not sure if they sell the electricity to uh, UMass or the net metering credits to UMass. Uh, but um, uh, but yeah, and I guess I would question Laura's comment. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't receive any additional incentives beyond what SMART offers. Um, and so um, uh, it seemed to be doable by the um, by the solar uh, developers that at least specialize in that solar canopy uh, design. Yeah, no, just to quickly respond, it's not as though it's not financially doable. It's just like having done a number of canopies, it's certainly less financially attractive than a standard um, greenfield ground mount. So mm -hmm. that's all. Gotcha. All right, Chris. I just wanted to um, 
let everyone know that when we did the tax incentive um, for affordable housing, we filed a home rule petition with this legislature. So um, it had to be approved by both houses of the state legislature, but it was in fact approved. So it is possible to do it, but it's something that you have to get the legislature to approve. Hmm. Interesting. And just so, so in, in terms of putting this in front of the uh, legal counsel, um, is this, if we were to suggest something along these lines, would this go in a zoning bylaw or would this be just a, a separate um, uh, um, issue that the town would bring up and, and pass uh, or not uh, and, then, and then get um, do, do the um, home rule petition? Chris? I think the tax incentive would not be part of the zoning bylaw, but it would be a separate effort by the town to make this happen via the state legislature. Yep. Okay. All right, good. Are we good on this question? Discussion? Okay, great. All right, then uh, we'll get to number 10, uh, which is, uh, will the solar bylaw stand up given the Massachusetts statute 40A section three and uh, see attached related land court decisions that Stephanie had separately uh, added to our packet uh, that underwent several years of litigation. So, uh, was that you, Janet, who put with this one forward? No. No. Okay. I, I, I think it's kind of a beast of a question. So, um, it kind of goes back to, in a weird way, we're asking like every, specifically all the issues that were probably in these cases. You know what I mean? So, it's kind of saying, well, all these bylaws stand up, and I'm not sure that KP law can answer it, but I understand. I understand that intent behind the question. And just for my clarity is the, the statute 40A section three, the one that uh, states that, you know, no un, unreasonable restriction on solar development. I think, yeah, yeah. But I don't, I'm not, it's not my question. Okay. I guess that's, um, yeah. Um, I guess um, I guess maybe who whoever posed this question can maybe give us a little bit more information on what what we're getting at. Obviously, we're going to write it solar bylaw, so it it needs yeah. to uh, so, stand yeah. up. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it was myself who wrote this question, and I thought I already touched upon it earlier on. Um, sorry, guys, I just ran to the bathroom. So if you were talking, I wasn't with you for a second. <laughs> um, so. Uh, what, what I really want like, to get a handle on, because I've really heard um, conflicting information than what we discussed here, which is like the definition of public health and safety is very narrow. And um, what I want to know is, are we like we're taking a lot of time and resources to develop this bylaw? And I know that in multiple instances across Massachusetts, the bylaws have been shot down, okay? And projects proceeded as, as planned, um, even if it wasn't just a moratorium. So I just want, uh, basically, however you want to phrase this is fine, but I, I want to raise the specific statute um, to the attorneys and provide them the material that we have. And I'm sure there's, well, I know there's um, other rulings that are out there and I want their opinion, basically, on what that means for our bylaws. Yeah, Martha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, again, just going back to the day that we had the discussion of these different court cases, my impression was that some of these cases that came before the land court were kind of weird and rather specific. It, it wasn't a case of shooting down the, the bylaw. It was a case of the particular interpretation for some 
you know, particular thing. I think there was one about the 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 height of the bushes you had to have to block the view of the solar array, or or the one that went to the uh, SJC was about whether there could be an access road to the solar array in the other community, and so on. So, I don't think that those cases were were really questioning the overall bylaw, they were questioning very specific interpretations. And again, it's the SJC ruling that that kind of is the overriding one that's saying you just have to justify that really it's an issue of public health, safety, and welfare. And uh, a lot of these specific little ones, little cases that came up, you really couldn't justify that. So. All right, good. Um, Janet? So I, I, I want to agree with Martha is that the cases that we got from the land court were um, challenges to planning board and ZBA decisions. And the, I read two of those and they don't knock down the bylaw. Actually, I don't even think there's a solar bylaw in them, but they don't knock down the bylaw. They knock down the decision by the planning board or the ZBA in a very specific permit. And so and even in Tracer Lane, the SJC in Waltham isn't knocking down a solar bylaw because there actually isn't one. It's kind of saying you're only you've only allowed um, large scale solar arrays in one to two percent of your land. You can't do that, you know. And so it it, it sounds a little technical, but I I do think the issue that keeps coming up is what is public health, safety, and welfare. And I think those are really broad. To me, those are really fuzzy, big, broad words. And so that would be a good question, I think, to ask the KP law is like, what have the courts found that are inside public health, welfare, and safety? I think it's going to be like a zillion cases saying this and that and the other thing. Um, and so I think that might be a good question. You know, but I don't know any case that where someone's bylaw has been knocked down on these kind of grounds. So um, and you know. So I, I wonder if asking about the definition of that term and how broad it is or how narrow it is. Be more I mean, I think that goes to this earlier question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to chime back in, I um, I actually would still really like an attorney who's an expert in solar to look at these materials. And actually, I probably will afford additional materials because when I read this, um, what's happening here? Sorry, I got, um, I actually think the definition of public health and safety is very, what I've seen is very defined um, based on the recordings of the court cases I've, I've watched and I'll, you know, can send those. Um, so I, I just, you know, I know that we had our own discussion internally, but, you know, um, no one here is a attorney that focuses on solar. So um, I think it's, I think it's just important like this sort of the, I would like to know that the attorney is familiar with this Massachusetts statute and basically all the questions we're, we're putting up on this board, you know, um, I want to make sure this individual understands that, you know, these, this history exists. So Mm -hmm. And I and I say that because it's very it's very different than other states. This is only in Massachusetts. Okay, so um, Laura, just and then we'll go to Chris um, for my clarification. When you say will will the solar bylaw stand up? That's not. No, I want to know like referencing Amherst yeah. solar bylaw that's not written yet. But is it more no, like I mean, will these so, solar bylaws yeah, the ones no, that are attached? Yes, it, yeah. So for example, we say we don't like you know we're going to have uh, requirements on visual impact. And, you know, like, you know, and that, and, and the developer makes a case that it's cost prohibitive, you know, can we require, a, you know, a, a, can we shoot down a project because, or require something in the bylaw that limits development on certain sites because of view shed or, you know, th things like that, even cutting down trees, um, you know, like, is that something that we can even limit if, if it's not clearly defined as public health and safety? So um, that's really what I'm getting at here. But it needs rewording. Yeah, okay, Chris. I just wanted to reassure everybody that um, Jonathan Murray is the person that we're working with at KP Law and he was presented to us as a person who's very knowledgeable about um, 
legal issues with regard to solar installations. So I feel like we're in pretty good hands. Um, Rob Mora and I reached out to him during the um, effort to put a, a solar moratorium in place. And so we've been speaking to him about solar issues now for quite a while. And I just wanted to let you all know that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yep. All right, good. Um, let's move on. Um, and these, these uh, any, any input from Stephanie or Chris, because I didn't share these ahead of time. Um, that I that I just put in. Um, can a bylaw require that a ground mounted solar array over a certain size and land characteristic uh, be be designed to enhance require that a ground mounted solar array be be designed to enhance pollinator um, and wildlife habitat consistent with the surrounding ecological system within limitations so as not to endanger the performance and safety of the solar installation. Now there is there is a um, adder, if you will, for pollinator friendly uh, solar. Um, uh, but uh, there's also a lot of work going on 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 on, on that as well as wildlife friendly. Uh, this is not uh, that there's, that you know, ground based wildlife that does not necessarily inter interfere or need not interfere with the solar array itself, but still provide some actually protected habitat for such things as snakes and turtles and um, <laughs> those sort of things um, in, in ways that um, are, are advancing relatively quickly in, in, in good sort of habitat that also uh, involves uh, pollinator support. Um, so I guess my, my, the purpose of this question is within a bylaw, can that, can, uh, uh, and require may be too strong, but um, can, um, can projects uh, be uh, required or, or, heavily encouraged to um, to assure that they're developed with these uh, characteristics. Again, not to state that we would want to add that to the bylaw, but um, just to know if legally we can. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, I don't, I don't have um, intimate knowledge of the Hickory Ridge solar development, but I remember when we were on the planning board you know discussing how we wanted to enable you know migration of a species uh you know through the area and with regard to the fencing you know not being bound to the ground so they're you know that sort of thing and uh but i guess you know that was a zba thing that they had to handle so it, it seems you know, reasonable that the bylaw would, you know, try to enhance certain, you know, design considerations uh, in that respect. I could. Any other thoughts or comments on, on that question? Okay, uh, let's go to number 12 then, which is also one that I added sort of a late notice here. Um, can a bylaw require, and this got to something we talked about earlier, uh, can a bylaw require that in the case that in the case that a solar development results in the removal above a certain threshold of acreage of trees, uh, that a developer demonstrate that a similar acreage, or uh, maybe it should be more, uh, but a similar acreage of trees within the Commonwealth have been additionally and permanently protected from development through a land trust state uh, covenants uh, or similar method? I think you should change the word covenants to covenants with a T, that's all. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah, I, I, was, I was struggling on what the proper covenant. Okay. I, love the, I like the word covenants. It seems, it seems like a harmonious thing, but I think it's covenant. Um, Martha. Yes. Does that mean that this specific uh, developer had to like contribute money to the land trust to buy the acreage or something? Or can they, I mean, it sounds a little vague. Of can they, can they just point that? Oh my! Look, the Kestrel Trust just pres uh, preserved forty acres the other day. Can't we count that? You know. So, uh, yeah, good question. I guess my intent with additionality here was that yeah, it was uh, 
yeah. additional uh, by by the this pro uh, 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 from from a result of this project. I would throw the word offsets in maybe somewhere. Um, but that's when you when you introduce the concept of an offset. That's like a product into it unto itself. It's I get what you're trying to say, Duane. It's and I love this idea where you're going to cut down some trees and we're requiring you to plant trees. I mean, we do this regularly in the Conservation Commission. Mm. You're going to be required to plant trees of a certain diameter. You know, like not all trees are equal. Certain kinds of trees, certain size, um, and not. You know, I wouldn't use. I, I only would. I'm only concerned with offset because it's a product or like you could say equivalent to or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, offset, I, I, I tried to avoid that terms because there's a whole, I wouldn't say baggage, but a whole discipline associated with offsets. Um, that's a bit different. All right, good. Stephanie. Thanks, Duane. Yeah, hearkening back to my work with the Conservation Commission, uh, this question leads me to want to prioritize as much locating that um, mitigation, if you will, locally before we look out to the entire Commonwealth. So I would say, you know, try to prioritize um, local mitigation first, you know, um, and then maybe expand to across the state. Yep. And local can be within the Pioneer Valley. It doesn't necessarily yeah. mean just in Amherst, but you know, I would try to have some kind of a more um, mitigation that's sort of closer in proximity to where the project is. Great. Yeah, I guess the um, uh, I, I added that if that makes sense, so that we can get legal opinion of whether we can do this, uh, and then I think in in the bylaw we can talk, you know, discuss language and develop language that we as we we feel we'd like to push for um in terms of as as make, making the, that uh um additive forest sequest forest uh land as local as possible i think would make sense um yes and to martha's question earlier about would this be you know just kestrel land trust is you know preserving x number of acres and that's just part of it um uh, you know, I, I agree that it's not, it has to be additional. It wouldn't be, yeah. it wouldn't be something that's already being preserved. It would have to be additional acreage. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this? Let me, before we go into the battery ones, um, which yeah, uh, yeah, Jack. Yeah, I guess, I, I, you know, we, we're, we're, we're on this forest issue. I'm a little confused about, you know, where do we get uh, our timber, our wood for construction purposes? And it seems like, you know, you know, <laughs> I am a little ignorant in terms of, you know, protection of our forest, but it seems like it's a product and it needs to be harvested. And are we, I mean, I'm a little confused when we, it just seems like there's like a no cut sort of mentality, you know, in the state. And I'm just wondering, like, so where do we get our wood from? And, you know, I mean, I, there are protected lands, I understand. And that's, that's very clear. But for lands that, that don't have that, you know, I'm just wondering how much control does, does a, does a town or the state have over forest tracks? that that are you know uh, pretty much an agricultural product uh when it comes down to it i mean we need you know I, so I, this is a little confuses me and so maybe someone on the uh in the group can uh, educate me with regard to uh the sacrosanct sort of standing of certain you know woodlands versus others yes um Maybe Robert can help us with that, or or any other any other thoughts. <laughs> I I can certainly offer a little bit. Most of our wood right now probably comes from Canada. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of regulation, um, 
from the state on cutting plans and regulating what can be done and where it can be done. Um, I'm not really sure exactly how far you want to go with this, but um, it, I think it's certainly reasonable to, to have regulations. I'm personally, I'm not sure I would need this mitigation, but um, yeah, most of our would probably right now probably comes from Canada. You see it coming through town all the time on the train. And um, what else? Yeah, I mean, in, in, and there's, um, in my somewhat limited knowledge, um, there are, and my, my, I mean, we can talk about this and when we get to the nitty gritties of a, of a land, of a, of the language in a, um, bylaw, if we include something along these lines, but, um, in terms of the, um, uh, protected from development, that would need to be defined as well. Uh, my thought there was protected from um, the, the, from you know land use change uh, development into a housing or or uh, yet another solar project, for example. Uh, but it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, mean that it couldn't be a permanently um, coveted covenanted uh, uh, or or um, protected forest uh, area that would still be maintained as a working forest. Yeah, yeah, that was. Because, uh, yeah, to, to, I think, J Jack, I think's point, I mean, we we kid ourselves if we think that we are, um, don't need our forests for, for uh, wood products. Uh, and if we, if we um, make all of Massachusetts off limits, that doesn't do anything for climate uh, because we just get the trees from somewhere else. Um, okay, Martha. Yeah, that would just to continue that of, of what is defined as a, as a working forest. I mean, that means that one where you you harvest the wood for for wood products and to make a profit for the owner of the land, and then you you replant or you you know are cutting selectively rather than clear cutting, or you know. I think doesn't it doesn't it depend on what's your stewardship of that of that land and, and so on? Yeah. Like yeah, as 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 one who ancestors were farmers in New England, and you know, you had to have your woodlock because that was your source of fuel for the winter and it had to be sustainable because you had to have it for this year and next year and the next year. So uh, you know. So great. Okay, let's. Um, we have a couple of questions also um, uh, specific to battery storage, um, which obviously is in our purview as well. Um, maybe I wasn't the only one that saw, saw something aligned with this in the Gazette this morning uh, uh, in terms of uh, battery storage um, development interest in, in our town. Um, uh, and so um, we have uh, this set of questions. Uh, can there be a limitation on the size of standalone battery storage um, uh, on the minimum setbacks um, uh, of, of, the, uh, of this energy storage in excess of, of, of if it was a building um, and uh, setbacks with regard to uh, uh, residential uh, buildings specifically? So let's address those. First, um, and um, we'll st I'm not sure if Janet that had to do with the uh, storage ones or prior, but go ahead. I'm sorry, you're calling on me. Yes, please. This is a, this is where I feel like the answer is yes, 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 because um, these are all things that zoning normally regulates. You know, and you know we know batteries are volatile and fiery things and make noise. So we, you know, we have zoning that talks about noise produced by, um, um, you know, I'm blanking on the word, the splits um, and screening requirements for that, for, you know, all sorts of things that we don't want to look at like trash receptacles, you know, visual stuff. And so, you know, batteries have safety implications. It has, you know, visual impacts. It has sound impacts. So I feel like all of those things is going to be yes, yes, yes. And I, in, and I guess the question in people's mind is, 
can we regulate battery storage that's related to a solar development because of 40A section three? But I think the answer is just going to be yes, because you know something that produces noise can burst into flame. You know, <laughs> um, you probably don't you want probably don't want to have your house next to it. Um, so I think that you know, but I, I also feel like if people need that certainty, we should just ask the question. So. Um, yeah, Laura. Yeah, I was going to say, I have um, an issue with um, speaking about battery storage as though they're volatile, noisy things, because I don't know, Janet, if you've been close to the new technology that often accompanies solar development, and it is actually none of those things, certainly not noisy. Um, so I think that so that's, I think, the first thing. I think, you know, to the best of our ability, it's important to sort of shed our own biases here and perhaps even go visit some solar plus storage that's abundant all over Massachusetts. Um, but I, when we talk about that first piece, limitation on the size of standalone battery storage, I do think someone brought this up before. There are two pieces. So battery storage obviously is critical because it allows us to sort of maximize the solar potential and deploy solar at different times of the day, but its footprint is actually quite small, certainly relative to a solar facility. So I, I wanna just be, I wanna think about, are we talking about megawatts here for standalone storage? Are we talking about acreage required? Um, and Cause I think we're, we're at a point now where almost all Massachusetts projects are going to be accompanied by battery storage, so. And, and as well as, uh, you know, what we see now is, is standalone uh, battery storage as well. Um, yeah, I guess I also, um, may, maybe the questions here for the council is not so much just sort of yes and no, but to get, try to noodle out some insights with regard to what becomes overly um, restrictive. Um, uh, um, to the extent that it would be would be challenged, um, and, and so if there's some insights in terms of how to how to draw that line, is it is it you know as long as it's comparable to how we provide offsets uh, uh, setbacks, sorry, uh, with regard to other such things, uh, maybe it's it's uh, that that's sort of the threshold to look at. Um, I'm also curious as the tech you know to as we sort of think about the bylaw and we talk about battery storage with such a quickly changing landscape of what that technology is, um, of how we, um, uh, um, how, how we um, write a, by, you know, how can we write a bylaw uh, that um, uh, may, may, may not be over sweeping of battery technology where some other battery technology doesn't have the issues associated with uh, stuff that we're thinking about today. Um, Jack. Yeah, I, I know brought this up and maybe Chris uh, Brestrup can, uh, you know, remind me, but I, there was a, uh, an interest in, in, for these standalone batteries, because that's gonna be a thing you know, moving forward. And I'm wondering if that uh, should be a sub, sub uh, section, you know, within this bylaw, just just for the sake of efficiency. And, um, you know, I, I, I know the, the white paper that's coming from the uh, Water Supply Protection Committee is uh, going to speak to this uh, in detail. I think we're, we're suggesting, you know, increased setbacks uh, for the battery storage compared to you know, a standard, you know, solar array uh, with regard to the footprint of the of the, the battery storage uh, facility. But um, where are we going, you know, with this? It just seems to me, I, I know it might not have been, you know, specific within the, within the charge provided to us from the town council. But I mean, I, th I just think like if we had to go back and do a battery storage by law i mean it just seems it just seems inefficient to me but um so i'm wondering if we can put a a subsection in there for standalone battery uh 
stories because we're going to be covering the topic. Mm -hmm. So why not, <laughs> you know, be efficient and 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 go ahead and address it within this bylaw. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to say, I don't think we know enough about what the um, implications of battery storage are and how those relate to or don't relate to the solar bylaw. So I, I would keep an open mind about whether we need two um, sections or not, but I think we are going to be working on both of these things. So we will definitely work on battery storage as well as solar installations, but we're just not sure if we're going to put them together in the same bylaw or not. It depends. Okay. Um, um, I guess I, I, to, I guess with the set of these questions, the other, the others uh, being similarly stated, can, you know, can there be constraints on uh, visual impacts in terms of, uh, screening requirements for battery storage, and uh, can the threshold of the amount of noise produced, can there be a, th a threshold for the amount of noise produced by battery storage? Um, whoever said it, I think is right in that, um, you know, the, the, the simple answer is yes, across the board. Um, I guess I'm, seemingly, um, I'm wondering whether um, there could be some uh, addendums to these questions or 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 uh, nuances in these added to these questions that um, provide guidance to the council uh, to give us a little bit more guidance on some of the nitty gritty that we're going to need to work out on some of these uh, on some of these issues. Yeah, Chris, sorry. So I think the idea was that we were going to send him these questions and then he was going to come back with a draft of okay. an answer to all of these questions and that the the board here, or the committee would have a chance to review that draft and have a conversation with this um, with this attorney. And then he would go back and um, come up with his final um, document. That doesn't mean that that's the end of the conversation. All during the time that we're going to be going through this process, we have access to our town council at KP Law. So we can continue to send him questions as, as they come up. So that's my understanding of the process. Great. Great. And then that, let, let, let's draw this to a close because I actually just looked at my, uh, my clock on my computer and we're like, getting it getting a time here so i think that's actually really helpful in terms of okay this is the path forward for us this is not the last time we're gonna um uh, we're gonna get uh, um, feedback from the from the council we'll have the opportunity to probe a little bit further uh in some of these new nuances that we're um that over the course of the next number of months uh, we're going to be confronting so let me um ask if there is a consensus uh for um allowing um, Stephanie, Chris, and I to um, review and do some uh, massaging editing of these questions to reflect the input that we've gotten from the group today, uh, and then move these forward to the council um, through through uh, uh, Stephanie and Chris's uh, offices um, to, um, to um, give us some answers. Uh, or at least draft draft their uh, initial opinions. Um, are every is everybody okay with that, or anybody dissenting from that? Super. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we'll um, Chris and Stephanie and I can can sort of um, uh, work on that offline. Great. Um, okay. Um, so let's see each other again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, say that we're at time. Uh, that being said, uh, I have two things. Uh, one is um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll defer items five and six to the next meeting. Uh, so let's just spend um, as short a period as we can to schedule our next meeting um, and maybe even move to a recurring time. Um, I think as a group, we decided that we're best off meeting every other week. 
um, and uh, that would put us at, um, if we wanted to stick with this time, and I think we fl flip back and forth between Thursdays and Fridays, um, and I'm not sure if there's a preference. Uh, I'm generally okay either way, as long as it's uh, Thursday would have to be afternoon or um, at noon or afternoon. Um, but um, would people be okay with with uh, sticking with what we have now on Friday mm -hmm. at noon, pretty much every other week? Yep. Great. Okay. I would, I'd actually prefer a Thursday afternoon, but is but I could do this too. Um, let me just raise that. Is it anybody that really cannot do Thursday afternoons or or would um, um, the Thursday afternoons a problem? Would it still be twelve to two? Yeah, let's say twelve to two. Is that Janet, that work twelve to two? <laughs> That works if it's on off weeks from the planning board, because I do a volunteer thing the morning after the planning board, so. Uh, and would, uh, would- Like, I could do after two or something on a Thursday, one thirty or two, any Thursday. But does that work for other people? I can't do later on Thursday. Okay, let's, let's stick with uh, Friday at noon. Okay. Um, we'll be done before getting into the real weekend. Um, uh, and I have a, I have a conflict Fridays at noon. <laughs> okay. Every Friday at noon. Yeah. Every Friday at noon. I have a, a meeting. Okay. It's just for this, just for this fall. <laughs> oh, for, the, uh, yeah. for this fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I skipped the meeting this week. Okay. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Um, well, I guess, um, would Friday, uh, either earlier in the day or later in the day? Yeah, the meeting's noon to one, so before or after that. Okay, how about one to, one to three? Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. fine. Sorry okay. about that, folks. <laughs> there were no, no worries at all. No, <laughs> it's, it's amazing that we've found... <laughs> time to work. So uh, let's go with um, the next meeting will be um, October 7, 1 to 3. Okay. Wayne, I'll, I, just have, I'll just have to leave early for that meeting, but that's fine. Just that one time, Laura? Uh, right now, that one time, yes. Okay. Um, okay. But, so let's stick with that. Um, and so, uh, Stephanie, you can make note of that. Uh, and then, but all of us can sort of put that recurring every other week, uh, Friday, starting the October 7th, um, one to three. Okay, great. Um, we have agenda items for next time that carried over from this time. Um, I do wonder about people's thoughts of, and it doesn't need to be next time, but having Laura um, present something to us or, or uh, give us some background information with regard to uh, solar economics um, and uh, development economics. Um, to me, I think that would be helpful uh, for us to hear and, and uh, have that as a consideration as well uh, as we move forward. Um, do people feel that that would be uh, worthwhile for us? Yes. Super. Okay. Um, so, um, Laura, um, uh, we could put that on the agenda for the seventh, but it sounds like you may be um, a little bit uh, Let me squeezed see. in time, and maybe so maybe it's better. Well, whatever would be the next time, the twenty first. Um, twenty first. Let's do the twenty first. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Uh, I guess for next time, I do really want to hone in on on sort of our work plan for for uh, starting to draft outline draft the bylaw. Okay. Um, okay. With that, uh, let me just quickly go to Martha if you still have your hand up or no. Okay. Uh, but um, with that, let me um, if Stephanie's able to open it up. If we do have some public comment, any public comment or 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 um, questions. 
Okay, Steve Roof has his hand up. Steve, hey, hey, all right. I've allowed you to talk. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for all your great work. I've been following all your meetings, if not in real time, um, watching the recordings. Wanted to make one comment about your questions for legal counsel today. Pretty much all of those questions about restricting solar development. And I suggest that perhaps your group think about asking legal counsel about the possibility of allowing solar on lands that appear to have pre-existing regulations against solar, such as chapter 61 types of lands or perhaps town owned open space. Uh, and a specific question might be, what steps would be legally necessary for the town to permit ground mount solar on portions of the Cherry Hill Golf Course? Now, asking that question doesn't mean that you want to do that. You just want to find out what the possibility of doing that is. Um, so that's the one suggestion on, on that. Just want to also add an editorial comment. <clears throat> Your group is focusing a lot at this stage on restricting solar development in town. And I want to remind you that however much Amherst restricts solar development in our town, we are going to be pushing that development into a, other communities. Because as Martha noted in one of your August meetings, we need greatly expanded renewable energy capacity to meet the Massachusetts climate goals. And also remember, as we're considering the benefits of our forest and our view sheds and things like that, we currently benefit greatly from the sacrifices, real sacrifices made by neighboring communities that host the fossil fuel power plants that provide all the electricity we use. Those communities like Ludlow and Springfield and Chicopee have really high rates of asthma, um, reduced property values because of those fossil fuel power plants in their neighborhoods. So keep that in mind as you also think about maintaining the beauty and character of Amherst. Thank you for all your great work. Thanks, Steve. Okay, um, Mike Lipinski, you're allowed to talk. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. And uh, usually I'd encourage you guys to stay focused on the task at hand, which is creating a strong solar bylaw that protects the residents of Amherst. But I think the offer that Laura made today to give everyone a peek at the big money interest behind these large solar scale projects would be fascinating. I believe she mentioned that 95% of these projects are sold by the original developer to another entity. I'd love to hear more about that. Why does this happen? Yeah. It, it's clear that there are, there are large amounts of money and risk involved in the development and construction of these big projects. But it's also clear that there's substantial amounts of profit involved. Having some sense of what the financials look like for a typical project and how much of that profit trickles down to the town in the form of pilot payments might be very eye-opening. So please set aside some time for Laura to give us all an education on the subject. It's likely our only opportunity to hear about it. Likely solar developers seem to be very quiet about these details when they promote their projects as much needed pollinator fields. They tend to be very quiet about how much money they're making. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Laura, I didn't know your, yeah, I just, your hand is up. I don't know if you wanted to respond just to that. To quickly respond, yeah. So my um, my session is not going to be focused on exploring the big money interest behind solar. Um, my purpose is going to be to educate the committee here on the development cycle, what goes into assessing a solar site, how the process works, not to go into complex financial models of partnership flips and, and so forth. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. And Renee okay. Moss, mm -hmm. I've unmuted you. Hi, thank you. Um, I just have a few questions sort of having nothing to do with the substantive, substantive um, content today. Um, I have one question I'm wondering if anybody can answer. I'm just curious as a member of the public as to how many members, you know, the range, how many people from the public um, were viewing the meeting. So that's one question I have. The second question, I'm a little concerned public comment is after the official um, ending time of the meeting. And I think in some ways it dissuades 
public comment and as a committee that's supposed to be really engaging with the public, I would just urge you to have the public comment before the end of the meeting, not after the end of the, of the, the official end of the meeting. And, you know, I appreciate, you know, the, the depth and the length of issues that you had to go into today, but I would hope that you would just give the public time to talk within that two hour period. So thank you. Thanks for the work you're doing. Dwayne, I can respond to the number of attendees. It yeah. varies throughout the meeting. Uh, the maximum we had was 16 at one point. Thank Great. you. And, and Renee, I'll just comment. I'm, I'm the time manager for the meeting and I'll take full responsibility for not getting the to the public comments along with other agenda items before the end of the meeting. I do recognize how that's an, uh, an, 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 an not just an inconvenience, but also um, not respectful of the uh, public participation um given that we post the time frame for the meeting uh so we'll try to uh, make sure we get that in uh before the end of the meeting uh, time uh, the formal end of the meeting time uh going forward but thanks for raising that and if anyone else has any comments or questions for the committee could you please digitally raise your hand Okay, there are no additional, oh, sorry. Nope, not from the public. No more nope, comments from the public. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, there's one more, yeah. There is one more. Uh, Kathleen, I am unmuting you. Go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, given Laura's response to the question about what would be the topic of of uh, of how the uh, solar uh, work gets done, there still remains the issue of who is making money off of this, who gets the electricity, how does the town benefit, how does the town get taxed? I think we are a town that right now understands enormous uh, taxation difficulties that are related to having institutions in our in our town that don't pay taxes and that this could very easily end up being another situation like that in Irving Massachusetts where 50 years ago they put in a hydroelectric plant the people were very careful in the town to make sure that the tax base would be um, would be helped by the development of the uh, hydroelectric plant on Northfield Mountain. And for 50 years, uh, that project has presented about 90%, I believe that's the percentage, of the tax base of the town of Irving. And that is because it's not simply uh, allowing a company to come in and say, Oh, we'll give you a pilot gift. We will we will give a, a million dollars to your to your school. Um, what they're doing instead is being taxed fairly and and carefully on the basis of the uh, the capital uh, development on the land, and not just saying we are going to give you something because you've permitted us to be here. They've actually been taxed on what the value is of the capital investment on the land. So I think that that if Laura's not going to do that part, it's really important for the town to have somebody finding out what are the big plans ahead for the next 40 years in the town of Amherst. Are we going to just have another situation where you have untaxed organizations like the universities are that really cause a lot of expense for the town, whether it's the roads or the firefighters or the police or what have you. So um, I think that this is part of, of deciding what is this solar industry that wants to come into Amherst. So I thank you very much and uh, keep up the good work. And Lenore, I've unmuted you. Sorry, I'm on my phone, and so I'm I'm uh, I couldn't I couldn't. Anyway, I'm having tech trouble. You can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear okay. you. Um, so 
thank you for all your good work and, and the time that you take to really like the weeds here. Um, there yeah, were a couple of, I, I understand that, that a lot of the- Okay, let's wait. Can you hear me? I think yes. You. Oh, sorry. Um, I understand that a lot of the, the conversation was about uh, points to bring up to legal counsel. Um, and, and that's just about what's legal, right? Um, and, and to keep in mind that legal counsel is going to counsel you on the past, not on, on history, right? Because our laws are our history and they're man-made. They're, they're not going to be counseling you on our future. And they're not going to be counseling you on natural law, which is, really has to be taken into account um, with what you're doing here, because what you're doing here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have to interrupt. Uh, yes. Lenore, can you introduce yourself and I'm so state sorry. Your location? Yeah. Yeah. Lenore Brick. You want to know my street? Strong Street, Amherst. Is it? And it's B R. Your your logo Why? there doesn't say B R Y C K. Okay. Yeah. Because gotcha. I'm on my Thank phone. You. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Jeff. Sorry about that. All yeah. Right. No. 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 I'm not anonymous. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh, the, the, the greater, I, I, I understand in what Steve was talking about, how you, you as a group are charged with, with drafting a bylaw to find appropriate places for solar, which we of course need, and we need to get our fossil fuels. But the reason you have this charge is because we are at this point in history where we're dealing with climate, um, a climate catastrophe and a, and a biodiversity collapse. And so that always needs to be in the background here. And one of the things that I'm noticing is that there's these knowledge gaps, which I hope will, uh, will you know, I'm hoping to get a committee together to present to you um, this, this information about, for instance, someone was talking about how you can replace five acres of forest with new, planting new trees and that that would uh, be a carbon equivalent, it isn't. Or the assumption that the fact that clear cutting forests, um, that there's a net gain in, in, the, in using uh, energy renewables, that's also an assumption. So the latest science that I am privy to and all of the scientists, climate scientists, forest ecologists, biodiversity experts, the people that are really working on the, the holistic approach to this climate issue are urging um, society as a whole to protect our, our forested land, to protect our farmlands, to protect our greenlands. Building a wildlife and pollinator friendly habitat under solar farms is not the same thing. And, and replacing a, and a tree plantation is not the same thing as the ecosystem of a forest, which, which is a sociobiological community that 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 contributes more than we even know to to our well-being so i just i just think we have um you know it's not the the comparison between photosynthesis and and collection it's not just about photosynthesis we just have a lot and it's not just about sequestered carbon and and that mathematics we have a lot more to learn and i'm i'm looking forward to hopefully being part of bringing some expertise to your group so that you can hold all of this. I know it's so much to hold, but to hold all of this as you draft, I'm hoping the best bylaw that has been drafted thus far. Thank you. All right, thank you. S Stephanie, I don't see any more. Um, no, I don't see any other public comment. Great. Okay, we do have one last panel, panelist comment or question or thought, Jack. Oh, I'm just um, I'm just wondering, um, uh, Laura's, you know, presentation in October, October twenty first. What what is that? I, I'm just trying to get the right verbiage. I can I can help you with that, Jack. I'll I I can tweak that later. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think um, to the point that was raised, I, you know, if there are other areas of expertise or knowledge gaps that we want to fill, let's also talk about that on the agenda next week uh, or in, in any week. Uh, and then think about, um, you know, are there people amongst us or people that we can bring in 
to um, bring us some, uh, some, some of this knowledge as we, as we move forward. Um, okay, um, all good to um, adjourn? Great, okay, hearing no uh, opposition um, and with apologies for running over, um, um, the, the meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Thank Have you. Good weekend.